Thank you, choir, and thank you, Carl, for reading this morning. I've been telling all our scripture readers this weekend, this is like the hardest it will ever be. So you can read any time now. You never have to worry about it being this hard to read. Yeah, I told uh, one of the young people last night, I said, it's the Super Bowl of lay reading. That's how hard it is. So we're, we're good and did a great job. I wanna, we're going to be talking today about worship and Nehemiah and how they worshiped here. We saw in the passage this morning. But I want to tell you about a tactic I used to avoid going to church as a child. Um, I don't know my mom, if you all had this in your house, my mom would always try and drag us out of our beds on Sunday morning and to church. And I had a certain strategy to delay going to church, to get out of going to church. And it's called what I call my sock strategy. I, did, did, I don't know if anybody else has a sock strategy. But when I was about eight or nine years old, it was the sock strategy that I used to try and get out of going to church or delay going to church because I knew the longer it took to get there, the less time I'd have to spend there. So I had this all worked out as a young person. And so my stra sock strategy went like this, because this is back in the day when you dressed up to go to church. And so I like today that you don't have to dry. I, I'm a big fan of come as you are and informal, and I'm good with that. So, but back in that day, back in the day, we had to wear dress clothes to church. So that meant dress shoes, dress socks, dress pants, dress shirt, clip-on tie. Anybody remember the clip-on tie, right? So that's what I had. And so I had to get ready for church. This, is, this took a lot more time for me than just going out to play basketball. So I would go, and we, it would start off with me dragging my feet. That's part of the, the, part of the strategy. But then as I would get dressed, here's how it started. I'd say, I don't have any socks, right? Delay tactic number one. So I would delay, delay, I don't have any socks. Mom would be running around trying to get everybody going right, and I'm going, I don't have any socks, can't go to church. <laughs> so then mom would come in the room, she'd march in the room, open up the drawer, pull out the socks, throw them on the bed, put those on, go back out, and I would be like, oh, called my bluff. Strategy number two with the socks would be, these socks don't match. Maybe they're like, light gray and dark gray. Maybe they didn't get paired up right in the drawer. I don't know. But I would find a way to find something wrong with the socks that mom picked out for me because so I wouldn't have to put them on. So I got it, right? Delay tactic number two. She'd come by. She wouldn't even come in the room. She'd put them on anyway. <laughs> Kept going. Like, oh, that didn't work. So then the other thing I would do was I'd put them on and I'd put on my dress shoes, which I hated to put on because dress shoes, when you first get them, are really stiff and hard and they hurt your feet. And if you only wear your dress shoes like once a week for two hours every week, they never break in, you know? And so they hurt my feet and I didn't like the way the dress socks felt in the shoes, right? And so I would say, I, I can't wear these. These hurt my feet, mom. I can't walk in them, you know? I can't get to church. You're going anyway. Get in the car, right? That was the response, right? But why was I doing this? I was, trying not, I was trying to get out of going to church, or I was trying to sabotage the family going to church. I was trying to delay going to church because I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to go sit on that wooden pew, and I didn't want to be bored for an hour. And so I didn't want to go to church, and so I used these delay tactics to, so I wouldn't have to go to church. Now, I know how hard it is to get to church on Sunday morning. Anybody with me here this morning? You ever trying to get everybody out? Yeah, good. <laughs> trying to get out of the house, trying to get everybody out of the house, grab a cup of coffee. Maybe you're having an argument with your spouse on the way out the door, and just is enough some, some weeks just to get to church. Did you know we offer more than four services every weekend? <laughs> we do. We have a 515 service, a 815 service, a 945 service, and 1115 service. <laughs> The reason is because I sit up here at the worship leader, and when we first start our services, it, there's like hardly anybody here, and they go, well, where is everybody? I'm like, don't worry, 15 minutes, this place will be packed. <laughs> and you know, it's exactly what happened this morning. Because I know, it's not, we all get to, we're, here's the thing, it's not about how we dress. We're glad you're here however you dress. We're glad you're here whenever you get here. That's not the point. But we think, I know what I'm saying is it's hard to get to church. But my question really this morning is, are we going to church or are we going to worship? See, when I was a kid, 
I thought I was going to church. I didn't know I was going to worship God. I thought I was just going to church. I was just going to go sit in this building. And that was part of our family's routine. So I'm just going to go sit in the building. I'm just going to go show up. I wasn't going to worship. And there's a difference between going to church and going to worship. And one of the things we learned today in the first few verses of Nehemiah that we read, that Carl read for us this morning, is that they purified themselves, the wall, the gates, the priests, the Levites, they purified. What they were doing was they were getting ready for worship. They weren't just going to show up. And that's the first question in our outlines today. Are we prepared to worship? Are we prepared to worship? Because a lot of times I think we just are, it's enough for us just to show up and it's hard. I get that. At the same time, when we get here, if we've had a struggle with somebody else in the family, if we had an argument in the car, if we've had to find socks, dress socks for our children, we're not always in the mood to worship when we get here. Does that make sense? Or we're not prepared to worship because our hearts have been distracted by so many other things by the time we get here. That's part of life. Now, when you wanted to, what they did was they actually purified the walls and the gates and everything. Now, you have to say, what, what was the reason for this? Well, one of the reasons for this is because it had been destroyed by foreigners who worshiped foreign gods. And so the whole place had been desecrated in their minds. It needed to be rededicated. It needed to be repurified. It needed to be purified again. In the same way, you and I have to repurify ourselves every time we come to worship to prepare ourselves because life will tear us down, won't it? will just rip us apart some weeks. And so our hearts are not always in that place of worship when we get here because of the week we had or the things that we're worried about or the things on our hearts. Now where, we've talked about this before, where is the place of worship today? Is it it a temple? Is it a building? Is that the place of worship? Where's God's temple today? Us. We're God's temple. We worship in our hearts. So we have to ask the question, how do we prepare our hearts for worship? How do we purify our hearts for worship? Now, when a metal, precious metal, a metalsmith wanted to purify metal, they would heat up the metal to a point where it became liquid. And when it became liquid, then all the impurities would be raised up into the top of that vessel, and they would take something and they would scoop off the impurities to purify the metal. They would call that the dross, the stuff that's not pure. And so that was the purification process. So I started thinking about that. How do you, you and I purify our hearts? Well, at some point before we get to worship, we have to begin taking away those things, stripping away those things in our hearts that are not going to help us to worship. Does that make sense? So we actually have to prepare our hearts for worship. We have to purify our hearts for worship. So those things that we come into worship with sometimes, whether that's that argument in the car or a disagreement we have with a family member or a friend or somebody cut us off in traffic or whatever it is that created that impurity, as we come into worship, we have to start to say to ourselves, God, I need to let that go so I can worship. I need to take my to-do list and I need to let it, set it aside in my heart and allow myself to worship. I've got to stop thinking about where we're going for lunch today after the service and begin to worship. So worship is really about stripping away those things, those distractions, those things in our hearts so that we can be present in worship. One of the things I did um, when I would worship, when I was not preaching or leading worship, one of the things I would do actually was I would not wear a watch to worship because I found that uh, wearing a watch for me was a distraction because I would keep looking at it, you know, what's the next thing, I would be, because that's what I do all week, I look at my watch all week, I'm on a schedule all week, but I found I wasn't worshiping, I wasn't being worshipful, so I decided not to wear a watch when I went to worship. Now, that's a dangerous thing, but, you know, I actually can see the clock, (laughs) and what I'm saying is, trust me, (laughs) trust me, but don't worry about it, be present in worship, be here, allow yourself to worship, Now, I have another trick question this week. This is a trick question. I am warning you up front, it is a trick question before you answer it. What time does worship start at our church? Anybody want to take a guess? 11.30, yes, for some, yep. The day we're born, that's a good answer. That wasn't the answer I was thinking, what do you think? All the time, that's a good answer too. The answer I was thinking about was actually our worship service starts at, on Saturday night at 4.55, uh, 7.55 in the morning, 9.25, 
and 1055. And the reason is because we start all our, our intention, our design, we don't always get it right. Our intention is to actually start with pre-worship music. We call that a prelude at 930. But if you come on Saturday night, you'll notice the worship team starts five minutes early to prepare because that's a time of preparation for worship. Does that make sense? Because we know that just getting to worship sometimes can be hard, and that is a time for us to kind of strip away all those things in our minds and our hearts to prepare ourselves. That's a time to prepare for worship is what it is. It's called a prelude at this service. But it's music that allows us to come in and say, all right, I can just sit here, I can start to set all those things aside, and I can begin to prepare myself for worship this morning. Does that make sense? You could do that in your car, listening to the, choosing what kind of music you listen to on the drive here. You could do it in the morning when you get up before you even leave the house. So there's different ways you can do that, but that's the design of it. Realize that it doesn't always happen. We're human. That's just part of it. So prepared for worship. If you're following along the outline this morning, not only did they organize people but there's something that they did. When they organized everybody, when Nehemiah got everybody organized for worship, so they purified everybody for worship, purified the place for worship, then they got ready for worship, so they're ready to go, and then they worshiped. And they, they did something in their worship. One of the things they did, their worship was all about giving thanks to God. That's part of worship, is to give thanks to God, to celebrate what God is doing. That's what they were doing. Now here's a question. What do you think was the reason they decided to march on top of the walls around the whole city? Because they could have marched around the outside of the walls. You know, maybe some of them had a fear of heights. I don't know, because those walls are pretty big and pretty, pretty high up. And so why, what was the reason they may have marched around the top walls? They could have marched around in the city of Jerusalem behind the protection of the walls, but they got up on top of the walls in worship. I started to ask that question, what's the reason they got up on top well, it was a witness, right? It takes us, took me back to chapter four. We preached, talked about chapter four several weeks ago, but in chapter four, this guy named Tobiah, who was one of their enemies, one of the people mocking them and ridiculing them, said, a fox couldn't even climb up on that wall. It would fall apart. And what was happening was they were saying, our God is a great and awesome God. Our walls that we built with God's help, they're strong. So strong that more than a fox could get up on them, huge choirs of people with musicians could march around the tops of them. They were basically not only, they were saying to the whole world, God has restored God's people. They were celebrating, they were happy, they were glad, they were joy-filled, they were having a good time because they, at what God had done in their lives. Worship is about joy. Worship is about giving thanks. Worship is about having a good time sometimes. There are times when it's time to be still and to be quiet, but there are also times to celebrate in worship and to give thanks in worship and to enjoy worship. Does that make sense? To do that is okay. It's okay to do that. Now, and that's really what they did. If you look at verse 42, it said, they played and sang loudly. They played and sang loudly. They didn't just, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the... It wasn't like that. It was full-on worship, full-on joy, full-on enjoyment and celebration. And that's the next point. Worship can be joyfully loud. It's okay for worship to be joyfully loud, to make a joyful noise to the Lord, which is what our young people just help us to do this morning. You know... Our good old friend John Wesley actually put in our hymnal directions for singing. Some of you know this, some of you don't know this. But there are directions for singing in our hymnal. And I'm going to read just one of those directions that Wesley shared with us. It's actually number four in the list of seven. And this is what number four says. Sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep. But lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. I love that. It's talking about courage. How many people here don't sing loudly because you're afraid of your voice being heard? I, that's my thing. You don't want to hear me sing. I don't have a good voice. I don't feel like I can sing well, so, I reser- you know, so I'm not as courageous with it as like, you know, the choir can be, right? So we're not as courageous, right? 
But that's what Wesley is saying. It doesn't matter whether you have a good voice. Sing joyfully. Sing with courage. Lift up your voice. Bet more so than when you sung the songs of Satan. Now, how many people have sung some songs of Satan with a really loud voice? <laughs> how many people have ever been to a concert and singing at the top of your voice at a concert, right? Or maybe a bar, you know, in the bar, and the music's blaring loudly, and you're singing loudly to whatever that song is, and it's not to God, right? You know, I mentioned this in the Pastor Pontius. I've been to some wedding celebrations around this church, and I've seen some people out on the dance floor. I've seen them out there doing the Macarena <laughs> and singing along, and I've seen some of them doing the electric slide <laughs> and some doing the chicken dance. And they're singing loudly. I don't see that. And then they come to worship. <laughs> it's different. It doesn't always have to be different. Maybe we ought to just all stand up and do the chicken dance right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> do the electric slide together. No. You don't want to see that. That would be horrific. But that's part of the point is do we have the courage? That's what John Wesley is saying. Do we have the courage to worship God, who has done great things for us, who we have a reason to worship when we'll sing out loud other songs that mean nothing or are not about giving thanks about anything. So what's going on here? Let me show you another guy who was a little bit crazy with his, uh, the, the, let's show him the crazy dancing guy this morning. This is on YouTube. And here's this guy, he's at a concert and he is having a good time. He is just celebrating, having a good time all by himself. This would not be me. How many people are thinking right now, that is not me. I would never do that. I would not get out there and do that, right? But notice there's another fool in the crowd. And <laughs> he comes up, and he's looking foolish along with them. Now, notice neither of them can really dance well. They're not like great dancers. They're not doing anything great. They're just having a good time. They're celebrating. They're enjoying life. And, uh, you know, I mean, the guy can't even do a cartwheel, right? So all this is going on, but just there's going to be one more fool, I think, that shows up in the video here in a minute. But this other guy eventually jumps in and, and starts to be a goofball with them. Now, at this point, how many people are going to get up and dance with them? Anybody willing to dance? All right, we got a couple people. I would not be in the mix right now. But I want you to watch what happens after these three th guys are there. Because remember, Jesus said where two or three are gathered... There I am in their, in their midst, right? Even if they're acting crazy. So watch what happens next. All of a sudden, two more guys come in, and then three more come in, and then four, five, six, seven, eight more come in. All of a sudden, people are watching them celebrate, and they're now wanting to be a part of the celebration, <laughs> right? Because these two guys that you guys, we thought were fools and idiots are now creating a mass movement, right? And they're all celebrating. Everybody's thinking, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to get shortchanged. I want to be a part of the celebration now. And so what happened is this became attract attract attractive. This became inspirational to the other people. And look at this. All these people just keep coming and coming and coming, and everybody wants to be a part of the celebration. Does that make sense? All because of two fools. All right, thanks, guys. So you see what happens is, is what's happening is, is that there were one guy who had what? What did he have? He had courage. The second guy had what? Courage. The third guy had courage, right? After that, it became inspirational. Does that make sense? What John Wesley is saying, have courage. Have courage to worship. They're doing it for no reason. We've got lots of good reasons to worship. And it's just a matter of us having the courage to lift up our voices a little bit louder than normal, having the courage to sing a little bit more lustily, as John Wesley says, than maybe we normally would. It's about our own courage and to just give God what God is worth in our lives and to say, God, you're good, and to give thanks to God, to have the courage to worship, which is exactly what they were doing that day and brings us to our key verse this week, Verse 12, chapter 12, verse 43. Let's read this together. Many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day, for God had given the people cause for great joy. The women and children also participated in the celebration 
and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. And one of the things we've been doing this summer is encouraging families to worship together just like they did. It wasn't just about the men, it was about the women, it was about the families coming together and worshiping together. And that's what we've been about this August, is families worshiping together and singing joyfully and being of good courage and worshiping our God and saying thank you God for what you're doing in our lives. And the last thing they did here after they sang joyfully, worship joyfully loud, is they made sure that worship didn't stop. And worship doesn't stop. That's the last point if you're following along in your outlines. Worship doesn't stop. They made sure that there were choir directors, singers, musicians, Levites, priests, they made sure that worship would go on and on and on at the temple and in Jerusalem all the time. They didn't want that worship to stop. They wanted to continue to be joyfully loud and sing and praise God for all the restoration that God had done in their lives and restoring them. And there are times when we need to continue our worship. So what I'm saying, again, is worship doesn't just stop here. A couple falls ago, I was out on my mountain bike riding out in western Maryland. It was fall time, and the leaves were bright yellow and orange, and I was riding up this hill, and, all the, and, and it just came to this point where the breeze kind of picked up a little bit, and all the leaves started coming down out of the trees. It was like snowing yellow. And I just stopped, not because I needed a break, but I just stopped. I stopped, and I just stood there with my mountain bike, and I just said, God, you are awesome. You are wonderful. And I stood there, and I just praised God. I worshiped God on my mountain bike in the middle of the woods. I felt like I was in God's cathedral. And I remember not only thanking God for the beauty around me, but thanking God for my family, thanking God for the fact that I could get on a mountain bike and ride it, thanking God for, for all the blessings that God had given me. And I just gave thanks, and I worshiped God out there on a mountain bike in the middle of the woods. And that's the point. Worship can happen any place, anywhere, anytime. We think worship only happens once a week. <laughs> That's because we're going to church. But we can worship anytime. So my question this morning is, are you going to church? Or are you going to worship? Amen.